So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Stefan Schmidt. Um, I'm working at the Huawei Open Source Technology Center. Um, have been working on the ONEO project for like two and a half years now. And I want to talk a little bit about how we are using Zephyr. So this talk is mostly focused on how we use Zephyr, how we make it part of the ONEO distribution, how we build things on top of it, and how we integrate it, and how we yeah, also use it on a developer perspective, how we do like maintenance and so on. So yes, we do contribute a little bit to Zephyr, but tiny, I would say. Um, but this is more like the user perspective here. So the agenda for today for the talk would be, I guess not many of you would be familiar on, on how, what, what a Nero is and in the context of that, what Open Harmony is. So we'll introduce that a little bit to, to set the context, set the scope, make sure that you know what we are doing here, why we are touching on Zephyr. And the meat of the talk will be about five different use cases I picked from our experience over the last two years. And like the problems we had, the solutions we came up with, the, the lessons we learned in the process. So there'll be like five very different ones, uh, some more technical, some more like process oriented and so on. And then there will be a little touch on, on future roadmap discussions. So let, let's set the scope here. So. Um, as mentioned before, the question is like how we use Zephyr in Eclipse on Euro and, and what we do with it. Um, as I said, this perspective is very much from a user perspective. And we have the needs we have are mostly for integrated integration, um, for having a stable Zephyr base where we can base our own features or blueprints or um, customer um, uh, solutions on, and how we would do maintenance on top of that. But as obvious, uh, as always, uh, we also have need for new features coming in, we need bug fixes coming in, so we need to make sure that we are picking new versions of, of Zephyr from time to time and how we are going to uh, do that. So this is like the scope we are looking at at the moment. So let, let's start with an overview on, on Euro. So on Euro itself, it's an, a project at the Eclipse Foundation. There's a working group at the Eclipse Foundation who's driving that. And in a nutshell, it's an, it's an operating system we are building or bringing up with, with a lot of like distributed aspects in there. So we want to have like a good uh, wireless connectivity in there to make sure that we can have different devices work together, uh, form um, more inter intelligent networks and, and areas. So the idea here is to bring something over which was started on, uh, on the uh, open, open Atom site in China um, with something they called Open Harmony. And that is an operating system that was brought up there. And Oniro is kind of the sister project to that. So that's something we are bringing up in, in the European area. So Oniro has um, this promise that we want to build for devices big and small. So for us, that means that we want to scale up from MCUs to normal application processors, but also going into like uh, servers and so on. So that is obviously a, a very difficult thing to do. And this is something you can't do with just one kernel, right? I mean, uh, the choice of Linux was obvious, um, but then on the, on the MCU space, we needed to look for, for something else as well. Um, so on, when we started on Nero, we looked around, and, and Zephyr was the most promising one for us to go along with. So our complete build tooling is built around Yocto. Um, and for Linux, this is a given. There's no problem to, to do that. For Zephyr, there, there was and there still is uh, Meta Zephyr, which was a really good starting ground for us um, to get started. And then for, for other auto systems. So we, we don't only support Zephyr, we also support other auto systems. In this case, for example, LightOS. But also we experimented a little bit with free autos and so on. So we always need to have some sort of, uh, in Yocto speak, layer where we would do like integration and making sure that you're using the correct uh, tool chain, make sure that you're building for the right targets and everything. So this is what we're having here. Um, end of last year, we did the Unio 2.0 release. That was very much focused these two years in the making, was focused on building us a horizontal platform where we have like a good hardware support, where we integrate all the different open source projects we, we want to rely on, make sure that we have that all set up and then have a broad um, staging ground where we then can go and build 
either products or the customers or the partners of the Onion Working Group can build products. And, but this year, is, um, the focus is very much on having a vertical solution. So once now that we have the horizontal platform, we want to go a bit deeper. And that is where Open Harmony would come in. So if you haven't heard about Open Harmony, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so it's a project uh, hosted at the Open Eton Foundation in China. It's the open source foundation of Harmony REST, which is a uh, proprietary op operating system from Huawei. It is Apache 2.0 licensed, so there is an easy way to transition code in and out. Um, they have a notation of different uh, systems, so they have many small and standard. I will come to that on the, on the next slide and go a bit more deep. And the support on OpenHarmony is Linux as well as LightOS. So LightOS is their ATOS system they're having on the other side. So why you might have not heard about it, it's not something new or something unused or anything. So there's, last time I checked, there was over 270 different certified products already in the market. And these are coming from over 100 different manufacturers. Um, as I said, the reason you might not have heard about it is because it's very focused on the Chinese market. Um, but the idea is to expand that, and Onira is like one of the steps going forward, going into the European market. So these three different types, um, system types we are talking about on Open Harmony would be like, maybe not the best choice of names, but that's how they name it, is Mini. That would be the level of a Cortex-M. It doesn't have to be ARM. Um, there are support for other architectures as well but it's like the, the level um, of a Cortex-M. It needs at least 128 uh, kilobit, kilobit of flash, uh, uh, RAM, no, flash, sorry. And then that's an auto system. Then you have small systems that could be uh, Cortex-A level. They could either operate on Atos or Linux, and then you have like the standard system, which would only be supported on the Linux side. Um, one of the, some of the key features, I mean, you look, before, if you look at the architecture diagram, there's like tons of different stuffs going on. Uh, but some of the interesting parts for this talk I picked here is um, the soft bus, which is a distributed um, bus which enables all kinds of devices in the same network to work together. And um, there's a uh, distributed schedule on data management on top of that. And the idea here is to form something what uh, the marketing department calls super devices, which basically means like all the capabilities of the different devices are brought together into a virtual unified device, and then that can be used from a user. Think about in your home, for example, you have um, a TV which has a sound system, it has a camera, for example, and then you have like your phone with a camera and sound and so on, or you have like your audio multi-room system or something, and once you enter the apartment, your phone knows about all these different uh, uh, things around you and has like audio capabilities of like the multi room system or the TV and it can switch automatically from like having your video call on your phone, walking into the room and can switch over to the camera of the TV and so on. So you have like all these capabilities and resources available and they are um, not specific apps or specific configurations you need to do but they can transition in between with these kind of super devices. Um, Open Harmony also has a, a kernel abstraction layer. I mean, yes, they need this sort of for like the Atos side uh, to have like things working on, on Linux and Atos. And they also have something called the Hardware Driver Foundation, which is their approach to find a way to have drivers working on Atos systems as well as on Linux. Um, that's some of the things. So, now we come to the part where um, I described a little bit of the, the use cases we had with Zephyr and um, describe what kind of problems we, we saw there and what we can do about it. So maybe you, you have seen some of that uh, yourself. So our first target was how we are going to build for Zephyr. As I said before, we are Yocto based for all our other builds. So we wanted to have a unified way for the developers to actually go with that. So there was Meta Zephyr available for us, which was a good start. Um, but the first problem we ran into was that the this, this layer was really mixing together a lot of different things. So it was mit, uh, mixing the basic machine support for different devices, different boards, but it was also bringing in distro policies and, and all kinds of other things in one layer. And once you enabled that, it was difficult to like override things or make sure everything is, is working smoothly in a, in a bigger context. That might work easily for your, like your one product or something, no problem, but if you want to go to distribution and scale up, then it's more complicated. So what we came up with, 
um, was we are splitting uh, the Meta Zephyr layer into two layers, basically one for Zephyr BSP and one for Zephyr Core. That solved quite a few of the problems. That was a, a lengthy process. That was people involved from our side, but also um, ARM and so on, where everybody had like the ideas how they want to transform that. But in the end, I think we we landed with something um, that is working well for us. The other problem we had uh, was that in Meta Zephyr, there was only support for a handful of uh, machines or boards. Um, I think like five, six or something like that. And if you compare that to what Zephyr actually is supporting, that was like a, a drop in the ocean. Um, so one of the problems we had was like how we bring this wide range of hardware support and enable, enable that for everybody that is building this on Nero and wants to do that for their own uh, products. So the first approach would have been we are generating all the machine files and putting that into the uh, MetaZephyr BSP layer. But the maintainers of MetaZephyr haven't been happy about that because that means they don't really know, is someone supporting that? Is it actually building and so on? And if, even if they would manually add that to CI on their side, that would need to scale up heavily without maybe there being user around. So the middle ground we, we did, uh, or we, we settled on, was that we write a bit of tooling um, to generate machines on a need by, uh, like, yeah, on a, on a neat basis. So what we did basically was we enhancing the CMake system um, on on Zephyr to this is a patch that is sitting in the layer, so that's nothing in Zephyr upstream or something. What but it basically does it? It looks at all the different boards that we're having here and maps between the K-config options and so on, and gives us the the tuned files you would need for the building on the Yocto side. And that would then again be exposed when we are running um, West boards. And then we can look it all up. And then from, with all the information we are getting at that point, we can generate machine files in Yocto-speak. That means we have been, we had an easy way for enabling new boards. That was like a matter of, of minutes, basically, to do that. And whenever we needed something and we want to bring it upstream, we then would go through the normal process, adding it to CI, do a manual, uh, verify everything is working, and so on. And that is something everybody can do. So the, there's a command now that you can actually execute. It's a, um, if you run it with Bitbake, it's just a normal um, receipt inside the layer, and then you can generate the different machines and see if that is working for you. So that was something that, that worked well for us. Um, maybe not in the full scale as we wanted it to be, but it was a good compromise. Um, and for us, that actually means that the extra work we did to unify the, uh, unify the way of the developer workflow, people could work with, with Sapphire in the context of a Nero, that was really wor uh, worth the work. So still, that means you can still go ahead and do your application development uh, with VEST directly and so on, and do your testing and so on. But if you want to go into production and maybe go to like shipping and deployment and so on, then you could still put it in, uh, in the normal workflow and have all the normal maintenance process and and uh, security checks, update, and maybe also like IP clearance and so on. As I said before, the main work we have been doing in Meta Zephyr has been around splitting the layers, we having adding in more sample applications. We have been doing a few tweaks and, and fixes here and there. Um, in the end, I think we are up to like almost 70 patches that have been contributed there. And on our side, we have been like regularly updating the layer and making sure that we, we started with an LTS release on Zephyr, then we switched over to a normal release because we needed some extra features, and at some point we will switch back to LTS at that point. So that was like one of the use cases, the initial one we, uh, we needed to solve on our case and make sure that that is working smoothly for us. But once you have the, the basic things in place, like building and deployment and making sure that that is all working, um, then you're also looking into what kind of features we are, we are looking for. So obviously, we need hardware support. Um, this is something that is kind of a given. Um, we, had, uh, we had started with a Nitrogen 96 board, and then nowadays, the board that we are mostly using on the, in the Zephyr context is an Arduino Nano, which is a Nordic-based, 52-based uh, chipset. But Besides hardware, we also have like um, a few needs for specific uh, subsystems or components, some features. Um, for us, it was mostly around connectivity and graphics. So we have uh, a need for OpenThread. We wanted to have co-op on top of that, and we wanted to have LVGL for the graphical part as well. Um, once we started to use that, we saw quite a few smaller problems, I would say. That 
most of them are not really related on to Zephi itself. It's more like if you start and, and use them in a, in a bigger context, it might be problematic. So for example, on the open thread side, we, we are building, um, there's a radio dongle we are putting in to use uh, open thread also from the Linux side. Um, and this radio um, needs a firmware and we are building the firmware with Meta Zephyr, which is all good. That is all working fine for us. But uh, at some point, there was a version bump in the spinner protocol, which is like the protocol going back and forth between the dongle and the uh, Linux host in that case. And um, given the different versions we have been using when uh, building with Linux for the Raspberry Pi, for example, or something, and uh, on Zephyr said as well, that was like troublesome and not. So we need to make sure that we, when we bump something on, on one, th uh, one side, we also need to make sure that all the corresponding user space tools in the different layers of, uh, on the Linux side have been on the same level. That is nothing magic or anything there, but it's something a bit more complexity. You need to make sure that you're bringing that in. Um, kind of similar, it was for the LVGL, for the graphic part. Um, we, we wanted to use LVGL and see if we can build something that where we can build a graphical interface that can be used on the Zephyr side as well as on the Linux side. Yes, there would be, obviously, would be in the application logic, there would be differences and you might need to have some sort of abstraction or so, but at least the basic interface was something we have been interested in, in building out. I have, um, we have another use case that actually touches on that a bit later, but that was one of the uh, things we started with. So while the uh, solution for the absurd problems we're having, that was something easy to fix, that was yeah, some bug fix here and there, and something we can, we can do in a, in a matter of days. Um, for LVGL, that was, was a bit more complicated because when we started to use it on the Linux side and the Zephyr side was really um, far behind in terms of like API level and versions and so on. So, and then we wanted to, to ramp that up and re-ramp that on the Zephyr side and there was nobody really like maintaining it and making sure that everything is working smoothly. So basically, we ended up doing quite a bit of work there to re-ramp it, um, having the external LVGL model updated to newer versions of LVGL, uh, fixing bugs on the way, obviously, and then helping also to like whatever regressions came up, get them fixed and so on. So that was um, a, bigger, a bigger chunk of work we have been doing there. Um, besides that, the main contribution from us was really like smaller things here and there. We need like a fix in the device tree for the uh, um, uh, partition table to make sure we have persistent storage for open thread and so on. But all of that was, was, was fine, basically. So the core functionality and the bring up of the hardware was, was easy, but like if you have like specific features or so, that was more complicated for us. And as I mentioned before, like we only had like 20 patches or so to Zephyr core uh, contributed. So that's not, not a big amount or something. But nonetheless, um, that part worked quite well for us to, to get us in a state where we can build, we can have it all like nicely working between Linux and, and Zephyr, and then now we can actually see what kind of applications and uh, things we can build on top of that. Which basically brings us to the, uh, second, uh, the third use case. So one, prob uh, one project we have been working on that was called Eddy, and it's an uh, enabling distributed intelligence um, in one of the areas. It, it doesn't really matter much like what the project itself was doing, it was more like how we wanted to use it and, and what actually is touching up on, on Linux and Zephyr there. So we wanted to have a system that can run on these small MCU-based uh, devices to get like some either sensor data or some like specific locations in there. And then you also have like the Linux side. And we wanted to have a shared code base as much as possible. That's what we, we set out with. So it was a C++ project, um, so, but uh, um, not too heavy. So it was fine to also run it on the MCU side. So we didn't use any very heavy um, C++ features or anything. And we wanted to use co-op. Um, we have a, had a need for JSON as a format, and we wanted to run uh, the connectivity over OpenThread. Um, and this kind of code sharing between the two is, as I said before, it's clearly not a problem for the Zephyr community, right? At least not for the developer community. That's nothing what you set out to solve. But I still think it's good at least to bring it up here because m there might be some other people um, doing the same here. Um, 
So the first problem we saw was that uh, for the for the co-op side, um, when we uh, investigated what kind of co-op support is around for Zephyr, you have the native co-op support in Zephyr, which was working well for us, but it's obviously a very different API to libcoop, which we have been using on Linux. Um, then the next step is how you would configure your, your threat device, your open threat device, to make sure that's actually in the same network, how you would do the commissioning, the bring up, and so on. This is very, very specific uh, on, on Zephyr compared to like how you would do it on Linux on the command line or with a, a systemd service or something like that. So we ended up in a situation where we had a lot, of, uh, lot more duplicated code than we hoped for. Uh, we did. Some abstraction were possible, but we realized soon that most of that um, happened on a way higher level. So we always had like specific parts for like ISO Linux or Zephyr. That was not code we could really share in, in that regard, which was a learning exercise on our side as well. Um, so maybe we, we started out with a too optimistic uh, idea on how we can actually use that. So um, one of the things I was wondering, I mean, maybe some people here know about that, um, or if not, you can bring that up to me later. Um, is, that a, is, a, is that a common request? Did the Zephyr team or project actually heard about that before, that they are, it would be good if there's a way to actually have sh uh, code shared between running uh, on Zephyr and, and Linux? So this is something, because maybe that's just a very niche uh, use case we are building up here, and we shouldn't really go into that direction. Um, yeah, and as I said before, so if I'm not talking about a full abstraction layer or something. I know that's very well that's out of scope for for the Zephyr project. So coming to our use case number four, um, we have something in on Nero called Blueprints, which is a little bit more than what you normally would see as a proof, <laughs> proof of concept. So we would do code, we would do a proof of concept, we would do documentation around it. Um, having all the, the tooling and so, and making sure that we build something that, that might could be used by some of the partners in the working group and go ahead and, and build a product out of that. And maybe we already have reached like 50% or 60% of the way for, for the basic stuff for them. So they can add their own value on top of that. So the, the problems we, we faced here was um, obviously looking around what kind of hardware we are selecting, bringing up the demo hardware, and then some very specific problems we run into on the size limitations on the, on the feature set we want to build for these demos. So as you see in the title, the, uh, the demo is about door lock and cats. Door lock is pretty self-explaining, so I don't think I need to talk about that. Cats stands for Context Aware Touchscreen. So basically the idea here is to have a, a touchscreen that would, depending on the devices that are in the network, the devices it actually discovered, depending on that it would show you different um, views on how you would interact with these devices. On the, uh, on the door lock, that obviously means it would show you a pin pad. Um, but if you would, it would find some, some sensors for like temperature or something like that, it could just show you a dashboard with some information about that. So it's really like, depending on the setting it's in, in the context it's in, it would uh, act differently. So this was like one idea we're having and we wanted to build a blueprint around that. Um, so for the hardware, that was pretty easy, I would say. You obviously need to be a little bit careful what kind of hardware you're selecting. Um, but given the very wide range of hardware support and driver support on Zephyr, that was quite easy for us to select the right components here. Um, more problematic was the idea um, to having the graphical part running on Zephyr as well. So uh, the idea was to have the door lock as well as cats, both of them running from Zephyr. So the door lock part is easy, but the cats part was way more, more complicated. And we ended up in, in switching over from Zephyr to Linux in the, in the in the middle of it. So let me explain a bit more about that. So the door lock is easy. As I said, it's just a motor driver. Uh, it has a keypad. We have like the, uh, the wireless chip is inside the um, SOC directly. So we have open thread on top of it and co-op and some, some basic uh, application logic for like setting pins, unlocking, and so on. So that's all easy and fits well into the use case for the MCU system here. Um, we started out with having LVGL running um, on the Nordic chipset as well. We connected a display, and we have we reached a stage where we actually can show some some graphical um, versions of like what we wanted to do. 
but we very soon um, came to the situation where we run out of um, resources, basically. I think the most critical one was really flashy in that regard. The, we have like one megabyte of flash was there, and with full Zephyr as an Autos, with, with the feature set we wanted to have, with LVGL as an external module, and then all the graphical assets for like the, the icons, and then maybe some logo, and then the uh, fonts and all the other things, we ran into a situation where that wasn't possible. We have been pondering for a while if we switch the hardware to a more powerful one with more flash and so on, or actually hook up an additional flash to the board or something like that. that obviously, all of that could have worked. But at that point, the time was short, and we wanted to get the demo or the blueprint out, so we decided to switch it over to Linux. At that point, that was, there was a good thing that the LVGL part was easily switched over, so that helped us. Um, and then we have the demo, and the, the picture you can see here, that was something we showed at an embedded world at uh, the beginning of the year. Um, there's a com uh, communication going on. So you have like the context-aware touchscreen on the Raspberry Pi side, and you could, um, as you can see, the, the motor is opening and closing, and you can control that from the keypad, eyesight connected directly to the door lock, or over open thread and, and co-op communication back from the context aware touchscreen. So that has all been working, but um, again, that was more like a, a problem on the hardware limitation side. Again, again, nothing coming from the from a Zephyr perspective, so that's nothing I would feed back and say that's something that needs to be fixed or anything. Um, I just don't know if there are better alternatives on the graphical side. So we selected LVGL because we wanted something a bit more flashy than a very, very basic um, interface, but it obviously comes at a cost in terms of size. And yes, the other point, we wanted it to like make sure that we can have something switching between Linux and Sapphire. So going from the technical um, use cases, we had also had one that is more process or um, yeah, more IP driven in that regard. So we wanted to have IP compliance. It's a, it's a core component of Nero as a project, as a working group. We wanted to not only have S-bombs generated for the builds we are doing, for all the artifacts we are building, but we also wanted to make sure that we have an, an audit team looking over all the components that go into our builds and verifying that um, it all works well together. So the licenses are compatible, the components, uh, there's no binary blobs and so on. So that was something we, we also had been running. We have been developing our own IP compliance tool chain, um, building on top of Yocto, getting all the information from there, going over the build artifacts, then uh, from there feeding it all back to Phosology. And there the a team of uh, manual auditors was looking over all the different parts that have been going into the images and making sure we have no problems on uh, license compatibility or um, actually files going in with unclear license or actually binary blobs or something like that. Um, when we enabled that for our Zephyr builds, we actually run into a few issues. So um, there have been binaries in the, in the repositories that have been pulled in in our builds um, with unclear license situation. So there have been uh, holds from NXP and Expressive um, where there have been binaries that have been part of the holds of the vendors that have been pulled into our builds, um, even if we, for example, didn't build for NXP or Expressive or something, so they still ended up in there. And that was something we, um, for Expressive, that was uh, solved without our um, any interaction from our side, but for NXP we brought it up and that got solved uh, later on. Then there was also a problem on the LVGL side. There was a, a font that was getting pulled in that was not, there was no clear license, uh, not, was not compatible to force to use there. Um, that was an upstream pro uh, problem that got solved in LVGL upstream and then uh, in back into the module and into the fork that we're having on, on, on the Zephyr side to get that in. There's still a few things with a bit of an unclear license statement. I mean, for engineers, that's maybe not so problematic, but uh, lawyers really go into the deeps here. Um, so if you have, for example, a, um, a file that is licensed on the one hand as a proprietary license, but also as an open source license, you might need uh, to have like a specific expression in there that gives the rights to the uh, Zephyr project to actually allow that. We saw some files in there for MCU boot and the NIOS 2F. Um, but what we did basically was, once we had all the results and phosology getting out there, we, we prepared a list of the potential issues, we looked over them internally first, and then reported them back to the Zephyr project. 
and uh, from the four ones we reported, two of them have been already been solved, so that was good. That was a very good uh, smooth process for our side. Two are still open or, or stay closed maybe at this point um, where we didn't really get much of, of feedback or um, engagement from the Zephyr project. I, I kind of understand why that is because, I mean, if you report a problem for a specific vendor license uh, in the code that's, that's sitting in there and that might need to give a specific grant to the project or something, um, it's very difficult for the open source project and the team behind that to actually deal with that. It would always need to go back to the vendor at some point or another to actually go through their lawyer team and so on to approve that. Um, but nonetheless, I think that these are important things to raise to make sure that whoever builds something on their fire um, has a good way to actually building a product uh, out of that. So these are the, the five use cases we uh, encountered, basically. I mean, we, we did more work and so on, but these are the five ones I thought at least worth sharing here, and maybe some other people have the same experiences here. So for us, the, the journey we are on right now um, is more not so much focused on Zephyr at the moment. As I said, the focus for this year is very much on, on having a vertical solution, uh, making sure that we can build on top of that. Um, so we are looking more into like having application frameworks and ecosystem enhanced, um, having better IDE tooling, um, profiling the systems and optimizing them, and then maybe in, in Open Harmony, for example, also placing some of the critical areas uh, with some, some other um, programming languages like Rust and so on. Um, but this is all not very related to, to Zephyr. Um, so the question really is here for us if, if there are any interest on having like Open Harmony running on Zephyr. So I've been thinking about how that, that could be done, um, but it really depends a lot on if there is enough, enough interest from the partners in the working group or for other people to actually express an interest to, to go that way. Because right now it's not on the agenda or anything, it's more like a, a thought process we're having. So if you wanted to do that, I mean, we had the talk before from Carlos who actually talked about like how they are pulling it all together in the Connect SDK um, from Nordic. And a similar approach could be taken here in terms of like just having an external Zephyr module to glue, uh, glue these both systems together. So we have, on the one hand, we have CMake for, for Zephyr, for Open Harmony. Um, if you use it directly, the components, you would have a, a GN-based build system. Um, also something, for example, Meta uses. Um, so that is something that could be done as well. It could be pulled together. Um, Open Harmony itself has already uh, support for Atos, so it has support for, for LightOS, so that means the, the platform-specific support, that could be something that could be enhanced and uh, adapted to maybe work with Zephyr as well. Um, and there was definitely be a, quite a big uh, porting effort to, to do the platform support, but also maybe touching things like the kernel abstraction layer and the hardware device, uh, hardware driver foundation and so on. But the point really is all, all of these things would only make sense if someone actually expresses interest and, and being part of the new working group to do that. So in case you have an interest in that, in case you really um, want to talk about that, get, get back to me either here um, or just when I'm around here, I'm at the of the conference all whole week, um, you can just get in touch with me on that. And with that, I would already be at the end and um, I'm more than happy to take questions now. Let's start there and then we go over there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for your point number five about the uh, IT compliance, I mm -hmm. think that you put together a special or a good chain in order for issues in the code and things like that. So can you describe a bit what, what you did uh, on the code chain part and uh, how this could be useful eventually even to watch your project? Could you add a bit today? Okay. So let me repeat the question. So the question was about the IP2 chain we've been building and if that is something that's only specific for, for Nero or is that something others could use as well. So when we started out, I mean, this S-bomb thing is like what normally projects are doing, right? They, they go, because that's something engineers can solve easily. You go and you say, okay, look, we, we need to make sure that we specify clearly um, how, what, what license we are having and all the things are working together and then maybe we can actually generate an SBOM out of that saying which files is having which license. You can make sure that they're inbound and outbound compatible and so on. But this is only like one part of what you would need if you go ahead and, and want to release products and go out of that. Um, so 
there, if you go into the more commercial space and corporate space there, then there are all kind of like commercial tools available, but there's also something called Phosology, and that's something how we build things around it. So what we needed or what we uh, was a way to get all the information out of our Yocto builds, get it through and get it into Phosology and find a way for the audit team to actually look into that um, and, and work with it and give us basically vouch for it to say, look, this is saying we can release that, it's all good. So that's basically what have been built. There have been like a few tools around that. I, I don't want to go into all the details, but there's like tools that get all the information extracted from the uh, Yocto site. Um, feed it back into Phosology, then we have a fancy dashboard which tells us this kind of the licenses that are in there, these are the inbound licenses, these are the outbound licenses, and these are the specific packages in, in, in Yocto, for example, that, have, uh, that are compatible or not, and then people can actually look and look at the different files that are getting direct into that. Um, this is like how we can see this specific C file is having this license statement and that might not be compatible with something else. And at that level, the audit team would go ahead and, and look at it and then clear all the things. Phosology has uh, functionality that would allow you for the next build that comes in that, uh, to reapply all the same uh, things you have been done before. And that's also functionality we have been using. And the, so the way we did the compliance to chain is that it's not tied to Onero itself. So the, it can be used by other projects as well. It's actually its own project at Eclipse Foundation um, where you can actually um, do that. And other uh, working groups in Eclipse Foundation actually are going to start using it. There. So for example, the, I think there was expressed interest from the software defined vehicle group, for example, they had an interest in that. And other projects could go ahead and do that as well. Thank you. So, question. Mm -hmm. uh, was that uh, upstream? Is that kind of the new model of working with that? So I, can, I didn't get the beginning. The, the, the work you did on Metazephyr to yeah. split things out into the BSP yeah. and the apps, is, okay. is that upstream? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is, yeah, that's that, is that like the, 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 the expected uh, work, working model with Metazephyr now? Yeah, it is. I mean, that's. I think that's in for like almost a year or something. I mean, as I said, this year we didn't even touch uh, much on that one. That was all last year um, on that part. That was like one of the first things we, when we needed to solve that. Now that was, uh, that was worked out already. So, I mean, the thing is MetaZephyr was started and it was maintained by, um, I think, one person from Intel. Um, it was more like a side project. So Zephyr itself is very much focused on VES and so on. And I fully understand that if you do like de uh, application development for, for Zephyr builds only, that's perfect what you want. Um, but MetaZephyr was already there, but it was like um, not so much maintained and like in, in a good uh, shape for production, I would say. Um, but all of these things have been solved. So we have been sitting together with people from ARM and the maintainers of uh, MetaZephyr and so on, making sure that we find solutions that are actually good, working for all of us. And the BSP stuff is uh, factored out and the core layers factored out. The only thing that is, as I said, is only sitting there as a receipt to generate the machines. That is not something where we, we didn't get the big bump of like more hardware support or something like that. But if you have an interest in that and want to do that on your own project or something, it should be a matter of minutes to get that added. And then it's mostly about like um, engaging with the maintainers to make sure that these things are keep working and then you put it in CI and so on. No, that's all in there. There's no, we have, I think we have a fork of MetaZephyr with only a few patches, but that's more like integration and maybe integration with our CI. So there's nothing big missing or anything. Any more questions? That's over there from the internet, I guess, from David. Actually, it's from me. Oh, wow, OK. Um, I just wanted to say I've reopened the issue file line to see if we can get that resolved. OK, cool. They're not really contributing anymore, so I don't know if we'll get feedback. OK, so let me repeat it. So David just said that he reopened the one issue we had on MCU boot and he is trying to get like a bit more engagement there. It might be difficult um, if they can actually get them uh, to contribute to that. As I said, these are more, the two, two open issues are, I fully understand, I mean, that engineers, they don't even, what, what should I do with that, right? You, you always need to get like your lawyer team involved in that, and that is really, really not the best thing to spend your time on, but to get these kind of things solved is the only one. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So I would say thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any more questions, I'm here and I'm here for the whole week. So, thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>